Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch. And get ready for some serious stories today. You are meeting my friend, Mr. James Berry. James has some really fun stories. How he got into music education, this pathway to a bunch of different interests in music. And it's a great reminder for all of us that music is why we do this thing. And we get the opportunity to share music with the people in our ensembles. So James is a, mu- is a, is a musician, obs why he's on the podcast but he's an instrumentalist and he has choirs and he does jazz and he does musicals so there is something in this for everybody i do come at this episode specifically for my pre-service band students because i teach secondary methods at the university of south carolina in aiken so some of the questions i asked today were specifically for and from those students to james but what's so much fun is we just keep telling stories james is such a good storyteller we talk about how to remove limits and to be versatile and how to really keep kids engaged and why There's a lot of really cool stuff in here. So versatility, it's a vibe. We also give a super amazing shout out to the sponsor in the middle of the show out of nowhere. But in case you've forgotten, the episodes on the Music and Matters podcast are brought to you by our friends at the Kinnison Coral Company and Kaleidoscope Adventures. So if this conversation inspires you to go travel, you know who to call. And if you have questions, I'm here for you. As always, like and review. It's how people get to hear more of these stories. But, you know, I'm just really glad you're listening. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with jazz pianist, former trumpet player, choir singer, director, musical person, <laughs> my friend, Mr. James Berry. Today, we are talking with educator, musical director, jazz pianist extraordinaire, Jazz camp manager, conductor, executive director. I mean, I could go on. This is James Berry. Hey, James. Hey, how's it going? I'm so pumped to have you on the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's just an honor to be here with you, Dr. Birch. Well, you should call me Emmy since we're totes friends. <laughs> okay, okay, totally. And, uh, <laughs> sweet to say it. Only my students have to call me that. But I love how I met you. So, y'all, James lives in Hilton Head area, which is across mm-hmm. the water from Savannah. It's South Carolina, but it's not that far away. And a friend who you've heard on the podcast, Jackson Evans, told me I would be friends with James Barry. He's like, you two are going to be great friends. No worries. So randomly, I send him an email, call him, text, all that jazz. He comes all the way over from Hilton Head. We have the best happy hour conversation. And we have been friends ever since. Absolutely. Yeah. We got to hear some great jazz too. Oh, so man, it was, it was awesome. some great jazz. And then you ended up letting me know you were gigging in Savannah when my parents were in town. And man, my parents were floored. Y'all, James is one of the best jazz pianists I've ever heard in my lifetime. <laughs> I don't no know lies. about that, but thank you for saying that. No lies. He was playing. <laughs> okay, Savannah has this staple of people who sing at the touristy style restaurants. That's all I'll say about that. And James made this particular singer sound exceptional. (laughs) It was so good. It was so good. (laughs) Anyway, I'm really excited to have you on the show because you bring so much to the table. Let's talk about who is James Berry and how did you get into music education and jazz? Absolutely. Um, I'll get into a little bit of my family history, if that's okay. Um, My my mom is a vocalist, um, classically trained. Um, My dad, growing up, a father, uh, my dad, he was a conductor, um, a pianist, um, my parents actually uh, divorced when I was pretty young. I was only three, um, but uh, I was always around music. My mom um, moved back to Maryland. She did a lot with the church. She did some community theater. Uh, my dad um, stayed in Maine, and he actually founded, um, which, which is now the largest community band, uh, the Casco Bay Concert Band. And uh, so I grew up listening uh, to bands all throughout the summer. Um, sort of a tradition in New England is they would have a lot of community bands play uh, sort of in the central lawn of the town um, and and just do that throughout the summer. Lots of Susan marches and things like that. Um, my so dad, cool. yeah, yeah. And then uh, my dad um, toured with a, a group called the Bellamy Jazz Band in the summer. Um, he also uh, would direct musicals, conduct. Um, he actually, fun fact, got to play for two different presidents uh, with his community band. 
um, President Bush and I think maybe uh, Reagan or Carter's wife or something. Um, but he just, he had an incredible ear. So um, just look up to my parents a lot for music. Um, and so I I actually started on violin. That was actually my first instrument. <laughs> so, uh, Susan marches, you go violin. Okay, why? I go violin. Uh, I don't know, I was sort of made to do Suzuki and uh, that lasted about six months. So <laughs> that was about it. Um, but then I got into piano um, when I was seven. And uh, another fun fact, my first piano teacher, um, she actually became my grandmother. Um, <laughs> she, <laughs> this is kind of a funny story, uh, but she was my piano teacher first. And then my mom married her son, uh, who was a youth pastor. And so she became my grandmother. Uh, oh, so, that so doesn't start- get said very often. See, yeah, this is yeah. why we talk so much, because you have great stories. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so... Of course, uh, it started off, she was tough, but then I got milk and cookies. It got a little easier after that. Um, and then I switched to a, uh, a conservatory teacher in high school, um, a teacher, um, Dr. Vinnie Peniman um, from Peabody Conservatory and uh, up in Baltimore. And uh, that was, she was tough, um, but she was amazing. Uh, we started getting into like the real serious classical repertoire, uh, you know, Bach, Beethoven, Chopin. Is that because you knew you wanted to go into music at that point? No, uh, it was kind of, actually, I had a friend um, named Jeff, and we um, both had the same piano teacher growing up, and he had switched to Mrs. Penniman first, and I was like, I want to do that, Um, and so I I wanted to- Why uh, are you in choir? Because all my friends are in choir. Why are you taking piano from the conservatory person? Because my friend Jeff is doing it. (laughs) Exactly. Life-changing decision based on uh, friends. Totally. Hey, that's an important concept to learn. (laughs) You can win a lot of students by their friends. Um, We just had another guy on the podcast a few episodes back, um, Ariane Harley Emerson, and he sang in the Peabody Children's Choir. So we know wonderful music is coming out of Peabody. Okay, so you're in high school. You're taking music at the conservatory. You're, you know, playing all the greats. Then what? Um, Basically, uh, she was like, I want to teach you, my teacher, she said, I want to teach you how to teach. I want to do pedagogy. And I'm like, what's what's pedagogy? (laughs) What's that even mean? Um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but she was really setting me up for being a music educator, even, you know, as a freshman and sophomore in high school. Um, and so I actually, my first, I did work at a general store and did some other random jobs, landscaping and making burgers and things. Um, but my first like actual well-paying job was actually teaching private lessons. Wow. Um, in yeah, high school? So, in high school. Yeah. So I did that, uh, pretty much when I started driving. Um, I had a couple of uh, trumpet players that I would teach that were younger, um, a couple of piano students, and I'd drive to their house and give them lessons. And uh, cool. yeah, it was like pretty cool making extra money. Um, and then I was, prob- I was probably like around the same age. I started playing Scott Joplin rags and my teacher was also getting me into the Gershwin preludes. And that was like, what is this music? <laughs> what is this jazz you, you speak of? And uh, my dad had played some jazz, but more kind of traditional New Orleans um, stuff. And so um, I just really started to get into it. Um, I got a, somebody gave me a Billy Joel transcription book, which literally had all of Billy Joel's songs, like the actual piano parts he played. And I just, I love that book. I I pretty much learned every song in that book. Um, And then I also got into, um, somebody gave me a Bill Evans transcription book. So I got into that. Um, and then I also got, I bought this with my own money. I got a, um, it was a soundtrack to the movie, The Firm. I'm not sure if you've ever heard that I soundtrack. have read the book. I've never seen the movie, but yeah. it, it's so funny that, cause like, as you're talking about some of these, like, I don't know if you know you're doing this and we can cut this out if you want me to, but you're like tapping the, like you're tapping the desk and it's almost like you're playing piano as you're like, <laughs> as you're f- thinking through these pieces yes, cause it's yes. so innately in you. And I think that yeah. is so cool. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I, I gotta remember like, the mic is right there. No, I'm like, oh yeah, like I, I bet that's the, I bet that's the melody in that hand happening. Yeah, totally. Um, anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, that was Dave Grusin, um did that soundtrack, and uh, there was a song in there, Memphis Stomp, which I just loved to, to play. Um, and so I got that, and then I got like the Forrest Gump soundtrack. I got like um, so Aladdin. The movie and, scores. Oh, I, so- I'm a. You just went right off. Like you went right from all the great like classical things into rags and pop music and film scores. And is that how you got into jazz? Kind of. I'm getting there. Yeah. I I, I really I really like in kind of getting into film music. I actually went into college um, 
my undergrad wanting to be a film composer. Really? So, yes. <laughs> Cause I was like, Oh, my mom's a music educator and my dad's a music educator. And so I really, so I can't possibly be a music no. educator, even though you gotta it's do something different. Sides of my yeah, I know. It's like, um, but anyway, I, uh, I actually went in as a communications and music double major. I went to Gordon college, uh, which is a private Christian college kind of North of Boston, about 20, 30 miles. Um, and the reason I chose that school was their college choir actually came to my church and performed and they were phenomenal. And um, I was actually about to go to James Madison University. I'd almost signed the final <laughs> final signature and uh, then made a really last minute decision to go to Gordon. All and, because uh, of a choir tour. For those absolutely. And that so, need that piece of information. Choir directors, take note. <laughs> it's a great college recruitment tool. Um, and I, I'll get to that, but I actually did end up um, working with um, C. Thomas Brooks, uh, who was our director up there, and he's pretty well known in Massachusetts. Um, I think he has his own choral series or something, but um, we just, it was an amazing, amazing experience. A lot of my friends to this day from college were in college choir. Um, so I'm sure you had a similar experience. Oh yeah, all the friends from college choir. <laughs> so did you, when you went for communications and music, mm -hmm. did you finish communications and music or did you switch? No, I did switch. I was, um, I was in music theory and I think there was like 40 kids in like theory one. And then of course, you know, it whittles down to like seven by theory four. <laughs> um, but I was, I was, I had a pretty good ear and um, was doing better than most of the straight music majors that were only doing music. So the professors were basically like, you need to do music education. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you've got a knack for this. You should be a teacher. <laughs> hmm. Haven't heard that before. Uh, yeah. And I, it, it actually was funny too, because the film program required that you live in Los Angeles for a semester. And I just didn't want to do that. Um, and so those sort of two things combined made me decide, okay, I'm going to go into music education. It'll, I know that there's a need for teachers and at least it's a path where I'll have a job at the end of having my degree. Um, and so it was sort of financial decision and not wanting to live in LA <laughs> and, and sort of not, you know, not knowing what was going to happen. I just kind of wanted more of a sure thing. And so uh, that's why I decided to get into music education. So after Gordon, yeah. okay, what was your major instrument though? Because you've talked about singing in choir. We know you're mm -hmm. an amazing pianist. Did you do piano, choir, or both? Uh, piano was my main instrument. Um, I actually auditioned on trumpet and, and piano. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was pretty big on trumpet in high. I didn't mention that earlier. Sorry. Um, I played a lot of trumpet in high school too. Um, and, um, I had auditioned on both at JMU as well. Uh, but then when it came down to, do I want to do two hours of trumpet or two hours of piano every day? I chose piano and, um, and I was, I did study completely classical. Um, when I was at Gordon college, I did have an amazing teacher. Uh, if she's listening, um, <laughs> shout out to Dr. Alina Polyakov. Uh, she's, um, she taught at Boston Conservatory and as well at Gordon. Um, so I studied with her. She was very tough. Uh, she's kind of from the Russian background, um, but in just an incredible, incredible teacher. She really cared. And uh, I'll never forget when I, when I did my senior recital, you know, it was like five, six hour lessons uh, leading right up to the uh, recital because she just cared so much that I give my best performance. Um, and so that meant a lot to me kind of wow. looking back on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we pick we pick music ad, right. we drop communications and film st film scores. We'll come back mm -hmm. to that another time. Mm -hmm. Did you go teach right away, or what was your next step? Yeah, I did teach right away. Um, I had a kind of I'll back up just a little bit and, and get a bit into how I um, got into jazz. But my freshman year, I, I'm at Gordon College, and we had all these mailboxes in the music department. And there's a note in my mailbox, and it was from a senior. And this guy, the senior. Um, he could play anything, you know, jazz, classical, you name it, he could play it. And he said, I knew, I heard that you like jazz, James, and this uh, restaurant called and they're looking for a pianist. Are you interested? And I was like, why in the world would you give it to a freshman? <laughs> um, <laughs> which was crazy. I would have been like, oh my God, seniors write me a note. Yeah, yeah seriously. <laughs> so I was like, I have to take advantage of this chance. Um, so this restaurant is it's called Periwinkles. I, I hope it's still there. It's in um, Essex, Massachusetts. Best clam chowder in the world, by the way, if you ever up that way. Um, and uh, <laughs> and I literally knew two jazz songs. I knew um, Autumn Leaves and Misty, and that was it. It was the only and and I knew it just because I knew the sheet music. Like I could read pretty well. And uh, so I went in and I, and I auditioned with those two songs. And they were like, "You have the job." 
Then what did you do? Where did you find all the rest of the stress yes, over so, here? Where was the rest of your set list? Yeah, so I so I I think the first Friday I played there, I had maybe like seven or eight songs and it was almost and I just kept rotating and uh and I did some film score stuff too. Um and so but what was really cool was I did this all four years of college. It was great extra money. I got some free food. I think I got 75 bucks for three hours. So at the time it was pretty good. Um, yeah, for a college kid. Yeah, for a college kid, it was it was awesome. And then uh, what was really great was just the experience of doing it. And uh, I would just encourage, you know, if you're looking to get into it, you just, you have to get it, kind of get out there and just do it. Even if you're awkward, like I was at first, um, you just have to go for it. Autumn leaves and misty, baby. That's, That's it. it. Yeah, yeah. So if you know those songs. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, so I would, uh, pr- but by the time I was a senior, I could play three hours without any music, you know, because I was just doing it so much. Um, but it just, it took that experience and the time of just people asking for stuff. And I was like, oh, I got to look that song up. And <laughs> oh, yeah, So you let people make requests. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. Okay. We've learned a couple things so far, James. I'm going to let you know what I've learned so far. Okay. One, <laughs> Go into what you know you need to go into. Obviously, you were destined for music education, and we <laughs> fought that, and it finally happened, and it worked out. Two, yes. even if you don't feel ready, go do it. And I think mm-hmm. there's a third one in there, one that we hear often. You should practice. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 you know, we'll come back to this when I talk about it, music education. But one thing I tell the students is, you see the end result of adults when they're, you know, professional musicians. But what you don't see is the, uh, the crying in the practice room or the slamming the piano shut and <laughs> running out the mm-hmm. door because you're just so tired of playing the same passage over and over and over. Um, that's the work. I mean, it's you you have to go into the woodshed at some point and just put in the work. There, there, there really are not any shortcuts. Um, even somebody with natural talent, you have to develop more than just talent. You know, you have to develop just the technique and you have to develop the musicality. And there, there's so, you know, there's so much to it. It's mm-hmm. it, the work, the work never ends. I'm so glad you said that because that's such a great way to look at it. You're another way of saying that is you're at the beginning of a book and you're looking at someone who's midway to the end of their book. And Mm -hmm. so you can't compare your chapter to anyone else's. But I also have a lot of students that ask, where does the time come from? How do you make time for practicing? How did you Mm -hmm. find the time to do all that practicing and learn all those new songs? That's, that's tough. I mean, I, there is like no one size fits all approach, I think. Um, But you do have to very intentionally set aside time you have to say okay from 8 to 10 p.m even though my friends are going to go out and hang out i gotta go put the time in um and that's hard (laughs) for a college kid that's not probably something they want to hear um but i think if you really structure your day you know but here the other point i want to make is that just running your pieces is not practicing you know a lot of people just think they can just run their piece and that's actually very ineffective you know find the find what you're not good at drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it, and then run your piece all the way through. And what I find too, is that a lot of times you have to walk away. You have to, you put in your two hours and you say, I'm done. I'm, there's no point in putting in six hours straight, unless you're, you know, maybe right before a recital or something, but you just, you put in your two hours, you walk away. And then sometimes your brain just some like crazily works it out in your sleep. I don't know how that, that happens, but I've had that happen so many times. So many times. My grandma mm-hmm. always says, it's okay. You made that mistake. Go sleep on it. And the mm-hmm. next day, every time, because I play piano for my grandma over FaceTime all the time. It's That's my, awesome. It's my favorite thing to do. We have little piano recitals every day. <laughs> That's <laughs> Random great. factoid that no one needed to know. Okay. That's great. So you're, you're into jazz. You have this gig. You do it all four years of high school. And then you start to teach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, um, I was actually the summer before uh, – I was actually living at the president's house. It was actually a really cool opportunity at Gordon um, where they allowed a couple of students um, to stay there and basically intern. And so um, I was still living in Massachusetts, really searching all over the East Coast. Uh, And what I was looking for was not only a good school, but I wanted just a place that I enjoyed living. Um, I wasn't just, I had done some student teaching in Danvers, Massachusetts, which is kind of a little bit closer to Boston. And it was good, but I didn't really want in that to live in that much of a urban area. I would just wanted to live somewhere a little bit more rural. Um, I was very into skiing. And so, uh, you know, I think when you're looking at your first job, when you're looking at really any job, you have to think about where you're living as well as the school. You know, there's, there's just so many factors. And so I saw a job advertised at SAU 9, which is in New Hampshire. Um, 
and that was uh, North Conway, sort of that area. And uh, it was for two schools in Bartlett and Jackson, uh, both very small. Uh, one was K-8, and that was three days a week, and the other was K-6, um, and that was two days a week. And the K-6 school literally had 70 students in the entire school. Um, so yeah, it's wild. Uh, so this was a multi-age classroom uh, situation. Um, basically, the school looked like a large house. Um, I mean, it was really incredible. Cool. And then the school in Bartlett, we had about uh, 400 students, um, K-8. And so both very on the smaller side, rural schools, um, very good schools. We had eight ski resorts within probably 30 miles. So I did so much skiing <laughs> when I wasn't teaching, uh, which I also really love. And, um, and the music scene was actually really cool in that, in that area, a lot of, you know, sort of hippie music and stuff, but it was a Did lot of fun. Did you find a place to keep gigging? Yeah, I actually, okay. So, um, I had some, some tough, like family stuff happen early on. Also 9-11 happened the first week I was teaching. I should definitely mention that. Oh, hold, <laughs> yeah. pause and reflect. Mm -hmm. Whoa, your yeah. first week. <laughs> Okay, so students that are listening, mm -hmm. and you're stressing about that first week. Yeah, you're still surviving. That was tough. I mean, I was I was teaching a saxophone lesson. Um, I was at that school in Jackson, very small, and I'll never forget. The principal came in. She said, "There's something on the TV. You know, come check this out." I brought my student in there with me. Actually, this little tiny office, and we see the second plane hit live. Mm -hmm. Um, and even in this rural town in New Hampshire, parents came, got their kids. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. everybody was just Scary. a lot of, a lot of fear. Um, and then we actually later that year had um, a family from the Philippines who had moved to New Hampshire and was killed in a car accident. And we, you know, these were kids we, we taught. Um, oh, so just so sad. A, <laughs> really, really a rough first year, yeah, really hard first year. Um, and just some personal, you know, family stuff that was tough. And, um, and so I, 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 I'll be honest. I mean, the first two years I, I struggled a bit I, as far as I didn't, you know, I went through the motions of teaching and I enjoyed teaching, but as far as uh, finding uh, what I loved outside of teaching, um, it was tough because I was living there by myself. I didn't really know anybody up there. Um, and, uh, and so it took some time, but interestingly enough, I was going to this church and this older guy, um, his name was Ralph Ferris and he conducted a community uh, chorus a community choir um, that met at the church. And he said, Hey, you should come check this out. And his background was Westminster choir college. Choir saving uh, the day again. Look at you. I know. <laughs> like I, I didn't really like plan it this way, but <laughs> it's what happened. Um, and so I go and it was great. It was like, I was probably the youngest guy there by 20 years or so. So many but community it, choirs fun. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool. Um, but it was good for me to get back into singing. And I actually met some other people that were in a community theater at the time, and they said, we're going to produce a show called the Spitfire Grill. And the story was based, it was a relatively new show. Um, the story was based on a true life story that happened in rural Maine, which was very close to where I was living. And they said, we need, you know, we need guys, will you audition? And I was like, sure, <laughs> why not? I'm not doing anything else. <laughs> Jazz, musical, community choir. I mean, yeah, yeah. Geez. And you're giving, wait, I have a quick question before we keep going. What were you teaching the K sixers and the K eighters. You said saxophone lessons. Were you also doing like general music, elementary choir? But like, what else were you teaching? So the K eight school, they had a full time music teacher, and I was part time the three days a week. Um, I mainly focused on general music, but I did some band, and then and I did some uh, chorus. Uh, and then the K six school, I literally did everything. It was just basically general music, but. I found a way um, because it was such a small school. I asked if I could pull the kids for private lessons from class and we worked that out. Um, and so I had probably like 15 fourth, fifth and sixth graders that I pulled for lessons from class and um, unique situation. I mean, I know a lot of schools can't do that, but it was, right. it was awesome. We did some small groups like trumpets and, you know, saxophones and so on. Um, so. Okay. One more question for that. So it was your first year teaching. We had all those crazy hiccups and bumps. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite method book you went to? Like, I know some of the people listening are band people. So what's your favorite method book that you use? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't remember the names of all the method no? books. No, okay. that's okay. But did you I remember it? it was blue. <laughs> hey, <laughs> so, uh, that matters. Yeah. Uh, but I would say, honestly, a lot of the resources I took, I think child psychology, um, child, you know, psychology of, of teenagers is so important. Um, I, I think the biggest way that you can grow as a new educator is classroom management. 
mm. above anything. I mean, you have certain tricks as a musician that you that you use. You're like, okay, this works with the kids. Um, but really, it's if you can't manage the classroom, you you're fighting an uphill battle. Um, and so I th- I think what I realized with middle school kids is they they just love to like g- just like drive you crazy. And so you can't let them do that. And uh, it took me a while to learn that. I had some eighth graders that I know just enjoy like making me really mad. And uh, so I had to work on that, but. But you did. But, you but I did, it. yeah. And 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 what happens is I, you know, I tell any new teacher this, I think it takes three years for you to mm-hmm. build your culture. And that first year or two could be rough, but don't, don't give up, you know, uh, I give it three years. And then. It does, culture and then takes it, time. Evaluate that. Um, but anyway, uh, to get back to the story, we I was doing the uh, the Spitfire Grill, and I ended up being a cop in the story, <laughs> which was really funny. And there was a the the whole score to the show was uh, bluegrass. It was all artsy, rootsy Americana kind of music. And I actually became really good friends with the guys in the band, and they were like, "Hey, do you want to join our band?" <laughs> An Americana um, so bluegrassy and- band. Yes. <laughs> okay. Jazz, so, music theater, yeah. bluegrass, Americana. Okay. I'm, I'm still on. I'm, I got it. Yeah. So their bass player, he had like this like crazy long red beard and he would like spin the bass when he played. And I mean, it was so fun. We had mandolin. We had kind of a uh, Johnny Cash style singer. Um, I played keyboard and we had no drums, which was cool and unique. Um, and so we toured, the name of the band was the White Mountain Boys. And uh, we toured literally all over Maine and New Hampshire and just played like ski towns and stuff. It was, it was awesome. (laughs) So cool. That is so much fun. Okay. These experiences are epic. How long did you stay in these two schools and in that band and in that area? Yeah. So uh, I was there four years. I was there um, from 2001 to 2005. Um, I was kind of feeling the urge to, um, to go further, you know, with education, I, I kind of felt as is if I just stayed there, I, I, I could easily stay there and just ski until I was 50 or whatever. Um, but I felt like I needed to just kind of push myself a little more. Uh, so I literally looked all over the country. Um, I actually came upon Boise State University, which is completely on the other side of the country, uh, but they had really good skiing. So again, <laughs> again I was like, I want to check out Boise. And um, I applied for a, a graduate assistantship there. And actually, um, one thing I would say to any college students is I think it's actually really good when you finish your undergrad to go teach and not go straight into grad school. Um, the reason I got that assistantship was because I had the teaching experience. So I went in um, and somebody, you know, Dr. Wires, she was um, directing the choral program at the time and uh, just an incredible rising star in choral world. And um, gosh, I learned so much from Dr. Wires and I was so fortunate to get that assistantship. Um, she basically let me direct the women's chorale, uh, which was called Vox Angelis and the Meister singers. I got to assist and direct and sing with them. And we got to tour with vocal jazz and just, um, did a bunch of, a bunch of stuff. And, uh, and so I was there for two years at Boise state. For and what my did you major program. in there? What master uh, did you get? Piano? Yeah. Piano performance and pedagogy. Was my okay. Master's. So we were still yeah, in but pedagogy I did, and still pianoing. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and actually, I was going to only do pedagogy, but my professors were like, why don't you just do performance too? <laughs> so I just went I, into it. There is a trend here. There is a, there is <laughs> yeah. a trend in your life of people being like, oh, you should add this too. Oh, you should try out for this musical. So did yeah. you get to sing in the choirs there as well? I did. And um, I mean, the the level of performance of those groups were, were incredible. Uh, I, and, and going back to Gordon college, we actually toured Europe a couple of times in Canada and, and choir tours, I think are just some of the most memorable and incredible experiences. Cause you just get to, you know, meet so many people, be in so many different cultures. Gosh, so, hey, so many great memories. <laughs> thank you for that. That's a great shameless plug for one of our sponsors, Kaleidoscope Adventures. If you want to go on tour, look at us. We just made a shameless plug. <laughs> Okay, so you're in Boise, uh, and you're yeah. getting your degree, your pedagogy, and your piano performance. Then what happens? Okay, so I get married also <laughs> in the middle of all this. Because <laughs> there's um, time for that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I got married about halfway through um, graduate school. And then I was doing my um, my graduate recital 
uh, in the fall of, or sorry, spring of um, 2007, and also found out we were gonna have a baby. Uh, number one, um, my daughter Emma, and um, and so I started. I, I again, it was again maybe kind of a similar trend. I didn't want to really stay right in Boise. I knew, I knew kind of um, leaving graduate school. I wanted to either go into college uh, education or um, or private schools. I just found that I think with private schools there was a little bit less red tape as far as being able to do what you want to do. But I was definitely open to a good public school too. So I, I really looked everywhere. Um, it came down to two options. Uh, one was in upstate New York, uh, about 10 miles from Canada, where they get like an insane amount of snow. Um, the other skiing. option, yes. And uh, the other option was Hilton Head, South Carolina. No skiing. No skiing. But no skiing. My, my wife was like warm and by the ocean if we're going to move out of Boise. So uh, water Hilton Head skiing? is water skiing, maybe. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so I, I came out here and interviewed for the job in, in March 2007, and um, and I've been here ever since at Hilton and Christian Academy. That's so cool. Okay, tell us what you teach at Hilton and Christian Academy. Okay, so I, I started off a uh, very small program. Um, I started off basically doing a little bit of everything, uh, but now I'm the director of fine arts here. Our program's grown a lot, and so I oversee all the music, art, and theater, um, but my main area of focus is band, AP Music Theory, and I also do some middle and upper school chorus. That is so, see, I think it's the perfect place for you. Looking at this amazing trajectory of the really cool things you've done, you bring such a great example of you love music and you get to every day show up and help more people love music. Mm -hmm. And it's so fun. Okay. We have to totally divert from your, how you got into the classroom to talk about your, your jazz camp. Okay. Yes. Um, it's a crazy story actually. Uh, so I, I'll start at the beginning of, uh, so going back to New Hampshire, the story of jazz camp actually starts in New Hampshire. Um, so kind of around the time I was going through some rough stuff, uh, 2001, 2002, I started going to, um, church and, uh, and the pastor became a, just kind of a father figure mentor to me. Um, his name was Sandy Crevet, and he was also a phenomenal clarinetist and he had studied with a guy from the Boston symphony. So we had kind of hit it off as far as like fellow music nerd, you know, um, and his son was homeschooled. Actually, all of kids were homeschooled and they're all really smart. And his son, Josh, he was about 12 and um, just could play saxophone like incredibly well. And, you know, I was really into jazz and um, Sandy said, you know, there's really nowhere for, for Josh to play. Do you have any ideas? And I'm like, hmm, maybe we should start a, uh, an after school jazz band. And um, I talked to my principal about it at Bartlett and he said, you can do it, you know, in the evening actually. And, um, and you can have homeschool kids, which actually I think for a public school to let a teacher come back in at night and have homeschool kids join. I don't know, like if they allow that these days, um, but that was an incredible, you know, incredible flexibility to allow that. Um, so it just became basically like a community jazz band um, for students that met in the band room. And what's crazy is, you know, New Hampshire in the middle of winter would be like negative 10 sometimes and kids would show up. Uh, they loved it. Uh, so we did it once a week. Um, and we actually came out with an album called, do you have a dog? Uh, <laughs> it's out there somewhere in the internet. <laughs> and the kids actually started, find it. yeah. Um, the kids actually started getting gigs and, um, we started playing as a, kind of as a group, um, really, really funny story. We had one gig at a lumber yard um, at Christmas. It was like a Christmas party for lumber people or something. And I'm playing and I have my keyboard and it's so cold. And so there's a space heater trying to keep everybody warm. And, and the student, one of the students is like, Mr. Barry, Mr. Barry, uh, <laughs> look at your keyboard. And I sort of ignored him and he kept saying it. And I, I looked over, my keyboard's literally melting the plastic is just like melting. It's just dripping. <laughs> and, uh, and so I pull it away all of a sudden and then it's like so cold. And so it freezes immediately. And so this keyboard has this like insane design on the side of it because it like half melted. What a great story. <laughs> I sold it like an, yeah, like it's like an art piece or something. Um, anyway, so we, we had this, we had this jazz band and it went for two years and, um, I also worked for a nonprofit called Mountaintop Music and taught some lessons. And they were like, we wanna do a summer camp. Um, and so I was like, okay, cool, I'll do a jazz camp. And basically 
recruit all the kids that were already doing the the evening jazz band. So I got together with another band director um, who was in my district and he had um, a big marching band background. And we actually, we actually uh, started our camp in a church basement. <laughs> okay. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't like, like sketchy. School it was like, after hours, I'm feeling like a Stranger Thing vibe. Yeah, you know, yeah. Basement of a church, mm, season two. So like, yeah, middle of the summer, church basement. Um, and kids would show up like with three energy drinks and then learn jazz. And uh, it was like three hours a day. We did some theory. We did a little big band or yeah, larger ensemble. And then we did some combos. Um, it was just three hours. And at the end of the week, we did a little thing for the parents. I think we had like 12 kids there. You know, it's kind of small. Um, long story short, I moved to Boise, go through all that, moved back to South Carolina. And I'm here a couple of years and I decide, you know, I really like to do a jazz camp again. Um, and so 2011, I decide, okay, this is the year. Let's, let's try to start something. So I actually called Josh up, my former student. He's now studying music. He's actually studying jazz at Temple University. Of course, because he was an amazing <laughs> jazz, like amazing saxophonist. That right. makes total sense. Okay. Right. So and he's you studying. were the person that encouraged him. I'm seeing the ripple effect of all these <laughs> stories too. This is good. Um, so he um so he studied with a guy named Dick Dick Oates, who's kind of pretty legendary in the saxophone world. And um, so he's like, Yeah, I'll fly down for the week. Let's let's do it. So he comes to South Carolina for a week. He's in college. And so um, him and I basically founded the camp and uh, we had nine kids that first year. It was all Hilton and Christian Academy kids, mainly, I think like one other kid from another school, but that was about it. So we have the final concert in the cafeteria. <laughs> and there, again, there was like nine kids, maybe, maybe like 20 people After at the concert. School, church basement, rando cafetorium. Yeah. Okay. We're yeah. good. We are so working we're our way up very slowly. Moving up. So what's crazy is um, we have this couple that comes to the concert, uh, Bob and Lois Masteller, and they also started the Jazz Corner. I don't know how they heard about the concert. Uh, I don't know how they heard about the camp, um, but they come and they say, we just started this Jazz Foundation, the Junior Jazz Foundation. Um, you know, it's just basically a nonprofit, which is to preserve jazz. And they were all about music education. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like, how, how could this happen? Um, so they were like, we want to help you, you know, make this bigger. And so I think that first year they may have like sponsored some t-shirts or something, but the second year we're like, okay, let's get a, let's get a website. Let's get a logo. Let's get some more faculty. Um, so going from year one, we had just me and Josh, uh, the second year I started to recruit some friends, um, that were other musicians, Eric Jones, uh, who's a amazing Savannah pianist. Uh, he came. We're gonna I have, have a whole story on, on how I met Eric. Wait, that's going to be need to get Eric on here. To come on the show. Yes. Yeah. He's Eric's like super big time now. He went on, he, he's like in the Savannah Jazz Hall of Fame and stuff. I mean, he's, he's an amazing pianist. You two rival each other though, because I have never no. heard <laughs> anyone play jazz like you. And then Eric Jones can just, you're like, hey, I'd like to sing this song. He's like, cool, what key? And he's like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm ready. Yep. Yep. It's that's, fascinating. Yeah, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And I have a whole story on how I met Eric, which is we, we can do another time. That's probably yeah, another we'll podcast. We'll have to share that later. Um, but pretty much everybody I asked to help at the camp, I had met in a really, really cool way. And my choice of faculty was not really based on the best resume, the best um, qualifications. It was really based on how they were as a person. And I, I generally can tell how people are, kind of their vibe, how they would do with kids um, pretty quickly. And if somebody comes at me and they're like, Hey, I've done this, 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 and this, and this, and they kind of have an ego. It's just already like, no, I don't really want you at the camp. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's, more, um, it, you know, it's a I, vibe. Yeah. It's, I, I hate to say that, but it's just it's completely true. It's so um, true. so the second year we were basically trying to sell something that did not exist yet. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, we were like, okay, it's going to be all day. We're going to do all these things. You know, we're going to have more faculty and so I actually had asked a local band director, a friend of mine at Hilton High School, um, Todd Smith. I said, Todd, do you want to come help at camp? He said, I would, but the guy you really need to get is David Carter. And um, David Carter, um, he had graduated from USC. He's a legendary jazz educator. So I cold called David, completely, completely do not know David Carter. And he is like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, hold on. Okay, so you're going from year one to year 
two billion. But okay, you're, this is amazing. Are you still keeping the same format though that you were doing in the basement? Is it like one-on-one lessons, large group, and pullouts, or what's the format looking like? So we basically are expanding everything. So we're doing okay. theory, we're doing combos, we're doing big band. Um, we decided to add an elective block where they get to choose basically something they're passionate about. Um, and we have the different faculty choose, you know, sort of their passion, and then they get to go to one of those. Um, cool. Yeah. And so every year, you know, we kept tweaking, but so this is crazy. We get to about June, the camps in July, we get to June. I have seven kids signed up. Wow. I have this amazing website, this amazing faculty lined up. And I'm like, this is terrible. I'm about six weeks away from the camp and I have seven kids. So I call David and I say, David, like, <laughs> I need your help, man. Like, we're not like, he knew everybody. I was like, we're not getting people. Um, what can you do? And we did not have at that time, we didn't have any type of overnight accommodations. So this was all local kids. Okay. And so David says, let me see what I can do. So about two weeks later, I got a call from a parent in Charleston and she says, all right, I'm bringing like 10 kids down and we're taking a bunch of like RVs and stuff. <laughs> cool. That's a true story. <laughs> so okay. we have kids come down with their parents in, in RVs. RVs. <laughs> yes. So cool. Yeah. So the second, the second year was just crazy. And uh, we ended up with about 25 kids um, the okay. second year go, going from nine uh, to that's 25. A, that's a and good then, growth. Yeah. And with then new sponsors too, right? Because you still have with that the new sponsor. sponsors. Mm-hmm. And um, I should add the the foundation not only helped with the website and the logo, but scholarships. You know, getting kids that couldn't afford it to just be able to come. And that's if you're run, if you're going to run a camp, I think that's going to be substantial. You know, I think having a, some type of partnership with a nonprofit is is huge. Um, and so year three, with um, the connection that the Jazz Corner has, they said can we bring in somebody really big time? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how in the world this happened, but we got Nikki Parat um, to come. And uh, Nikki is a bassist, a vocalist. Uh, she has like, gosh, probably 20 albums. Um, she played with Les Paul and she's from Australia originally, but she's based in New York. And uh, Nikki comes down. I'm trying to think year three, I think we added uh, Justin Barnes. I think we added Juan Roland. Um, just some real heavy hitters, amazing players. Um, Charlton Singleton came as a uh, as an artist in residence too, and he's won a Grammy now at this point. Um, and so it was like literally like a perfect, like awesome storm. <laughs> so this is year three, and, and just, you have all these big names. Year three. Did you fix the RV mm-hmm. problem? We did. We <laughs> we we got uh, we ended up doing some housing. Uh, okay. You know, we partnered with a local um, hotel, and we got a resident director. Um, and it just, it snowballed from there. Um, before COVID in 2019, we had 130 students with three different camps. Um, we have, we had kids come from Alaska. I mean, people, we have people that have planned their week in Hilton Head around jazz camp, which is just, that's it's so crazy. Cool. Okay. I love this story. Like, I love the, all these stories. Like, I kind of want to just call this like all the stories. Cause you're giving us a lot to think about here. Like you had a musical upbringing, but you still blazed your own path and pursued your own life mission. You you missed jazz, so you created something. And all that jazz love came from just jumping into an audition that a senior randomly put a letter in your mailbox for. You weren't right. even safe for. Yeah. Well, and, and even going back to uh, to meeting um, Sandy Corvette and his family, I mean, was because I kind of needed a mentor at that time in my life. And I never, ever thought it would grow into a 130 kid jazz camp. That's so I mean, cool. that's just, that's just, just, and, and, and I, and I think I want to just mention, like, this is not anything about me. This is, I mean, the people we have, it's, it's a family, the faculty that come literally look forward to this week every year. They, they come back because it's, it's like a family reunion. And, um, you know, for anybody with a church background, I think, um, you know, when you find your passion, that becomes, that really is your ministry. You know, it, it doesn't have to, you don't necessarily have to be a missionary or anything. You know, I think if you're doing your passionate about, it's going to show through to kids and you don't, you know, you don't have to be obvious. You can just be like, this is what I love to do. And I love sharing this. And, and that, you know, there's nothing better than that. I think it's a vibe if I'm quoting <laughs> you directly. Yes, <laughs> it's, totally <laughs> it's a vibe. A vibe. Uh, this is awesome. Okay. So some of my pre-service student teachers are going into mm-hmm. band okay. and they want to know, given your experience with musicals and jazz and having these different programs, what are your tips for getting started? What are some of the things that you wish you would have known the first time you had a band? 
Okay. Um, I would say, first of all, I'm not a big fan of the traditional conservatory method um, of music education. Um, and I know a lot of college music programs are still following that method. Um, so I think when you think about a jazz camp, I think one thing that gets kids really excited is you're allowing them to play bass. You're allowing them to play guitar. You're allowing them to play piano, um, drum set. I would say don't limit what kids want to play in your band. You know, if they want to play recorder and be a part of the band, if they want to play violin and be a part of the band, it doesn't matter. Um, I think you can make any various instrumentation work. Uh, bass is a great substitution for tuba. Piano can do really anything, you know, can really substitute any instrument with a synthesizer. Um, as far as guitar goes, one thing I'm big into is I don't mind teaching guitar tab. I think it's a it's a valid system of notation. Um, I think they should really learn it all. They should learn treble and bass clef and guitar tap and all 12 scales and everything. Um, it's, it's about versatility. Kids need to be versatile as musicians. Um, so don't limit yourself on what a traditional band looks like and what traditional band music looks like. I think you can make great music out of any series of instruments. You just have to be willing to do it. You have to arrange things sometimes too. I love that. But then you're using your creativity, which is something so many teachers are saying they miss in life. They, they miss the opportunity to be creative. And you're saying, remove the limits, remove the barriers, get creative, be versatile. And you're really addressing one of my biggest questions as someone in academia and not in the trenches. It's so hard to see teachers struggling and just asking, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? What can I do to help? What are you doing to stay afloat in a time when teaching is just really hard? I mean, I think the, the key is students have to love music. Um, they're, they're, I mean, the, the, the amount of students that are struggling men with mental health right now, I think with everything with COVID, uh, being at home, um, when they, when they want to be around their friends, you know, being, having to have a, to wear a mask when they want to see their friends' faces. I mean, everything that they've had to deal with has been really hard. And I think music should not really stress them out. You know, I think you want to teach them to put in the work. You want to teach them to be self-disciplined, but it shouldn't be a chore. It should be something that they do on their own. And um, it's not that you're tricking them, but you basically have to motivate them and say, hey, you know, practicing is only going to make you better. It's the most fun homework, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe the math teacher doesn't like it because they want to practice more than do their math homework. But um, that's the idea. I, I mean, they, they have to also be playing music they love. I, I, I tell my students, if you're learning a song of guitar, like if you're super into, you know, Nirvana or Pearl Jam or whatever, like learn a song that they did, like, that's cool. And then share it in band class. Like, I don't care. As long as you're still working on the music we're working on. Um, and I think it's good for them to hear that because... A lot of times I think educators can really put kids in a very small box as far as what um, they're allowed to do. And I really think the important thing in music education is you have to teach them to love what they do. When you do that, I feel like you reconnect to why we're doing it in the first place. And like you said earlier, it's hard sometimes with the red tape, especially in public schools, and you're really lucky to be in a great private school over in Hilton Head. But it's so it's so obvious that your vibe is that you love bringing music to kids mm -hmm. in a variety of ways. I mean, I love, I love seeing kids succeed in music. And um, one, one thing that we do here at our school is we, we actually have a recital coming up this, this Saturday. Um, I'm, I'm not sure when this will air, but, <laughs> and um, what we do for this recital is um, we allow students to choose a, a solo, a duo or a group piece um, it's not mandatory. It's literally for anybody that wants to do it, but we actually have 27 acts who are performing. It's going to be kind of a, a long wow. two hour concert, um, but we have Beethoven. We have, um, we have, uh, gosh, I think somebody's doing like a Harry Styles song or something. I think somebody's doing um, something from Pippin. Um, we got a Broadway, you know, we got classic rock, we got pop country. Um, and the, the rule of the recital is that they have to go out of, they go, have to go outside of class to practice. Um, they have to choose the music and it all has to be done live, no tracks. And Sweet. it's absolutely one of my favorite concerts of the year because the kids, we have some kids that normally would never want to volunteer for a solo, but they will do this concert. And, you know, they're up there performing for 200 people and it's a massive confidence booster for 
just for kids in general. I mean, you know, not just in music, but I've seen kids perform at this recital and then all of a sudden they're a little bit less shy around their friends and stuff. Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's important to have these special opportunities where kids can really shine. I love it. I love that you're offering kind of non-traditional and traditional opportunities. Okay. So what's the thing you really want the listener to take away from this episode? Oh gosh. Um, I think when it comes to music education, um, you know, a couple of points is number one, have the goal of making the students versatile musicians. Uh, you know, don't, don't have them in a box of only one style of music, you know, allow them to learn every style of music, allow them to learn other instruments. Um, we have students that if they play flute, have them learn alto saxophone, you know, if they play trumpet, have them learn baritone. There's, there's many instruments that are actually easy to learn once you get your first one kind of underway. Um, I would also say, you know, you have to ha teach kids to love what they do. If they don't love it, you know, maybe change your approach. And if it's still not working, it's okay if it's not for them. It's, it's, it's not for every, it's not for everybody. I think music is something everybody can enjoy, but not everybody loves to play it. Um, you know, but I, I think most people do. I, I hardly ever meet an adult who says they're glad they stopped taking lessons. Um, and then the other thing is, I think you don't want to make it a chore. You know, you don't want to make it. I had a band director in middle school that made us fill out practice cards and have our parents sign it. And everybody forged their parents' signature. Everybody made up how much time they played. And so I pretty much at that moment vowed I would never do that. Um, and so I just tell kids, hey, we're going to have a playing test on this piece. Do what you need to do to be ready. And they're, they're, they're old enough. They're smart enough. They'll, they'll be ready. You know, so those are my, my big my big thanks. You, you've created a culture where they can thrive and it's really evident and obvious. And I'm so excited that you are so close to our town here and that we get to be a part of the jazz camp. I'll link all the information. So if anyone listening wants to check out the jazz camp, I know some of my students are hoping to drop in and observe this summer. They're really excited to see it in action, but if Sounds they want good. to find out, I'll put the links below, but thanks for sharing all your stories, James. This was Oh, fun. you got it. You got it. A lot Such of fun. Such a cool day. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> all right. Take care. There you have it. Stories on stories on stories. Thanks for listening. It was really fun to talk to friends and hear how they got into this cool thing we call a job. I hope that you got an idea, got inspired, or just smiled. That's the whole point of these conversations on podcasts. It's a platform where we can just have a conversation. It's an extension of all those awesome happy hours at conferences and stuff, right? Those are coming up if they haven't already happened when this airs. Anyway, I'm really glad that you listened. I'm really thankful that you made this episode possible by supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash music it matters, or by just listening because every download makes it to where our sponsors are willing to sponsor the show. So thank you. I appreciate you. And you know, you, my friend, you matter. We all know that music matters, especially jazz camps that start in dark schools or church basements and eventually grow into awesome amazing programs that impact the world and i'll see you next time on the second